There are many people today who question the legitimacy of and need for organized religion. There are many objections that are made to the current state of organized religion. However, not all these people are uninterested in serving and worshiping God. Some of them simply see no need for their worship and service to be connected with any kind of organized system of religion. Instead, they view their service and worship to God solely as an individual matter. So, as we consider the question, do we need organized religion? Let's begin by defining the terms that are involved in the question. By religion, I'm referring to the service and worship of God or of the supernatural. By organized religion, then, I'm referring to an institutionalized system of religious practices. Now, certainly no one can rightfully question whether organized religion exists. For just within what is called Christianity, there are tens of thousands of different kinds of churches that represent organized religion. So our study hinges on the word need. That is, has God made organized religion essential to salvation? And then, as we set out to answer this question, we must recognize that only the truth contained in the pages of the Bible can give us the right answer. Jesus said in John 8 and verse 32, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Our opinions are simply not sufficient in saving our souls. It is only the gospel of Jesus Christ that is God's power to salvation, Romans 1 verse 16. And it is the words of God contained in the Bible that will be our criteria for judgment one day, as you can see in John 12 verse 48 and Revelation 20 verses 11 through 15. Therefore, let's give close attention to some things God has told us pertaining to this question about organized religion. As we do, consider Isaiah 55 and verses 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's answer should suffice us all on this question, and all questions. So, before we begin to really consider how God answers the question, I want to give some consideration to some common objections that people share regarding the question. Perhaps you have had one or more of these objections on your mind today. Consider just a few common objections and a brief response to each. Many people do not see the need for organized religion because they believe they can worship God anywhere. So they often conclude that they do not need to take themselves or their families to the assemblies of a church to worship. Instead, they can just worship God in the comfort and convenience of their own homes, under a tree in the middle of a field, or wherever they may be at a given moment. First, let me say that the statement, I can worship God anywhere, is true. For instance, whenever Jesus was responding to a Samaritan woman about the place people ought to worship, he said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We, we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. That's John 4, verses 21 to 24. However, the fact that we can worship and serve God anywhere does not address whether God has given us the responsibility to be part of organized religion. For just because God gives us the opportunity to worship Him as often as we desire to do so does not mean 
that we should not also assemble with a church to worship him. So we must not draw a conclusion that is too hasty just because we can worship God anywhere. Second, some people say, well, the church is full of hypocrites. Some people look at the churches they're familiar with, consider the people who are part of those churches, and conclude that the church, that churches are just full of hypocrites. So when they see people going to church on Sundays and then acting in sinful and worldly ways through the week, they see no need to be part of a church. They may conclude that they can just they can be just as sinful without going to church or that they want no part of a church that tolerates such hypocrisy. First, let me acknowledge that there are many hypocrites in churches today. Although God is the final judge of such people, it is far too common to see people who go to church act and talk in ways that are not pleasing to God whenever they're not in church. And it is also true that God condemns such hypocrisy repeatedly in the Bible. For instance, Jesus said in Matthew 23, verses 25 through 26, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of extortion and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee! First cleanse the inside of the cup and dish, that the outside of them may also be clean. However, the fact that there are hypocrites who go to church does not prove that God is against organized religion. It only proves that he does not want you to be like the hypocrites. In fact, don't you think that there are also hypocrites who call themselves Christians and are not part of organized religion? Yet that does not prove that we should not be Christians. So, we must not rashly conclude that God does not want us to be part of organized religion based on the presence of hypocrites. Third, some say, no church can save me. Some who object to being part of organized religion do so because they believe no church can save them. They say yes to Christ, but no to the concept of church. So, as they consider whether organized religion is essential to salvation, they have answered the question with a resounding no, because they recognize that Jesus is the only Savior. And therefore, they reason that since Jesus is the Savior, they have no need for anything or anyone else. First, let me wholeheartedly agree that Jesus Christ is the only Savior. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then, speaking of Jesus, Peter said in Acts 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So it is undeniably true that Jesus Christ is the only one who can save our souls and lead us to the Father in heaven. However, the fact that Jesus is the Savior does not, of itself, negate the need for organized religion. For the only way to be saved by Jesus Christ is to, be, is to fully believe in him and do what he says. Jesus even asks some people, In Luke 6 and verse 46, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? And therefore, if Jesus requires people to be part of organized religion, you must do so if you want him to save you. For Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says that Jesus became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Next, some say, No religious organization is completely accurate. Sometimes people get lost in all the religious confusion that exists in this world. As I mentioned earlier, there are tens of thousands of different organized churches that all profess to follow Jesus Christ. Yet, they all believe, teach, and practice different things. Perhaps you have even given organized religion a chance and 
attended some of the assemblies of various churches. But perhaps you have not found them to believe, teach, and practice what the Bible says. So, perhaps you've given up on organized religion because you cannot accept the confusion and error that is commonly taught and practiced. First, let me join with you in lamenting the current condition of organized religion. There is far too much division and confusion among those who profess to follow Jesus Christ. For 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 33 says that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God is simply not the one who has created all of these different churches. And there has been a large impact made by false teaching. And you are right to not be part of any church that does not believe, teach, and practice exactly what the Bible says. For Jesus said in Matthew 15, verses 13 and 14, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. However, just because the vast majority of churches are not what God wants them to be, does not mean that there is not one church He wants you to be part of. Although it's often difficult to sift through all of the confusion and false teaching that exists among churches today, God's Word will perfectly guide you in a search for the church you can read about in the Bible. So, do not neglect every church just because the vast majority of churches are not what they should be. And then, some will say, I don't need a church to tell me what the Bible says. Some people have the idea that the only reason they would need to be part of a church is so that they can be told what the Bible says. For there are some people in some churches who claim that ordinary people cannot understand the Bible on their own. So whenever they discover that they can understand the Bible without a church telling them what it says, they conclude that they no longer need organized religion and set out to just to study the Bible on their own. First, let me again agree with the premise that we do not need a church to tell us what the Bible says. In fact, everything about the Bible indicates that it was written in a way so that it could be understood by anyone who reads it. For instance, when the Apostle Paul made reference to his writings in Ephesians 3 and verse 4, he said, When you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Later, he said in chapter 5 and verse 17, Do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So, God has given us the ability to understand His Word whenever we diligently study it. However, just because you can understand the Bible without a church does not mean that you do not need organized religion. The fact of the matter is that organized religion exists for more purposes than just to tell people who, the people who assemble what the Bible says. So you must diligently weigh out all that the Bible says about organized religion before making a final decision. Now, as we consider whether we have a need for organized religion, we must consider the origin of it. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 13, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. So, if its origin is mankind, then we have no need to be part of it. But if God is its creator, then we should seriously consider what he says about it. So first, God created the universal church. The Bible teaches that God has established a church. Listen to Matthew 16, verses 18 and 19. Jesus said, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus directly stated that he would build his church, and this church, or kingdom, 
was established in Acts chapter 2. All the references in the Bible to this church before this time are in the future tense, that it would be established. However, all the references to this church after this time are in the present tense, that it already exists. Acts 2 and verse 47 even says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. This church can be called the universal church because it is composed of every person who is in a saved condition. And therefore, there is only one universal church God has created. But it is essential to recognize that God is the one who has created this universal church. Now, recognize that this universal church is organized religion. For God has told this church exactly what it must believe, teach, and practice through the pages of the Bible. And furthermore, this church does have an organizational structure, albeit a very simple one. The organizational structure of this universal church consists of a head and a body. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, And he, that is Jesus, is the head of the body, the church which is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. So, Jesus is the head of this church, and the church is his body. Next, God created the local church. So it's also important to recognize that local churches exist with God's approval. Throughout the pages of the New Testament, beginning in the book of Acts, local churches are seen to be in existence. And as God's Word touches on them many, many times, never once does God express disapproval for the existence of local churches. Although there were local churches that were guilty of doing things that they should not have been doing or failing to do things that they should have been doing, and were rebuked for such, the arrangement of local churches was still not condemned in any way. More than that, local churches are clearly seen to be part of God's pattern revealed in the scriptures, indicating that they exist because of God's perfect design. For instance, there was a church which was at Jerusalem, Acts 8 and verse 1. There were churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, Acts 9, verse 31. There were people who were part of the church of God, which was at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2. Paul told the the Romans that the churches of Christ greet you, Romans 16, verse 16. And there are many, many similar examples in Scripture. But, It is important to recognize that these are not different denominational groups. Instead, these are simply groups of Christians who are part of the universal church. Now, recognize that the local church is organized religion. For God has revealed his perfect pattern concerning how the local church must function, such as the way the local church is to worship God and the work it is to accomplish. Furthermore, God has specified an organizational structure for this local church. For instance, Philippians 1 and verse 1 says, Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. So, God wants there to be bishops who are also called pastors and elders And he wants there to be deacons in every local church, in addition to all the the saints or Christians. So God has clearly created organized religion. But it is also important to recognize that he has not created all systems of organized religion. The organized religion God has created is clearly outlined in the pages of God's Word. Yet there are many systems of organized religion that have never originated with God and cannot be found in the pages of the Bible. Let's revisit the fact that there are tens of thousands of different religious organizations in this world that all believe, 
teach, and practice different things. For instance, as you drive through the nearest town, you will likely pass the buildings of several different kinds of churches. Some of them are denominational churches like the Baptist Church, the United Methodist Church, the Presbyterian Church, etc. Some of them are non-denominational churches that are not part of any larger church structure. Regardless, it is essential for you to recognize that not all churches have been created equal. God's Word perfectly guides people into being part of the one universal church he has established and being part of a local church he approves. Failing to follow his word has led to the existence of the religious confusion and error involved in all the man-made churches. God has only created one faith, Ephesians 4 verse 5, and has warned against following any other gospel than the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said in Galatians 1 and verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. 2 John 1 verses 9 through 11 says, Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him, for he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. So, we cannot choose to be part of any church that has not originated by God's design and that does not follow his perfect pattern. For Ephesians 5 and verse 11 commands, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Now, consider with me some reasons to be part of Christ's universal church. It is important for you to recognize that God has created organized religion, but we still must search for an answer to whether it is essential to salvation to be part of that organized religion. So, consider a couple of reasons the Bible gives us for why we must be part of Christ's universal church. First, recognize the saved are in Christ's church. Understanding why you need to be part of Christ's universal church requires that you understand what this universal church is. Again, consider Acts 2 and verse 47. It says that the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, we already should recognize that the saved are in Christ's church. But to fully appreciate this, let's consider the context of this statement. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit came upon the apostles, and they began preaching the gospel in Jerusalem to those who had gathered for the day of Pentecost. When some people were questioning what was happening, Peter answered that it was the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, saying that, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. As Peter continued preaching, he taught the people that Jesus Christ, the one they had just crucified a short time prior, has risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, and is now sitting at the right hand of God. When the people heard that God had made the one they had crucified, both Lord and Christ, some were cut to the heart, And asked in Acts 2, verse 37, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter responded by saying in verse 38, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. As he continued to teach and warn them to be saved, about 3,000 people gladly accepted his word and were baptized. Acts 2, In verse 41, these who were now saved were added to the church. And then the Lord continued to add, the Lord continued adding those who were being saved to the church every day. Acts 2, verse 47. So, 
those who obey what God requires them to do to be saved are added to the church and counted among the saved. But those who do not obey God's plan of salvation are not added to the church. And therefore, it is God who adds people to the universal church whenever they are obedient to his commandments for salvation. And if you're not part of this universal church, you are not counted among the saved. It is at the point of baptism that you are added to this church and come into Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 says, For by one Spirit, that is, by obeying what the Spirit has commanded in the pages of the Bible, we were all baptized into one body, which is the church. Colossians 1 verse 18, Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Next, you need to be part of this one universal church because Christ only built one church. As we've already seen, Jesus promised, I will build my church in Matthew 16 and verse 18. Jesus simply never established any more than one universal church. He is not the head of many churches, but only of one church. So if you want to be saved, it is essential for you to be part of his one church. Listen to what Paul told some elders in Acts 20 and verse 28. It says, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. So, although there are many local churches, which we'll talk about next, there is only one universal church that God, or Christ, has purchased with his own blood. He simply has not purchased any other church with his blood. And therefore, if you want to be counted among the saved, you must be part of the church he has purchased. The Apostle Paul said that there is one body in Ephesians 4 and verse 4. No more and no less. And since the body is the church, as you can see in Colossians 1 and verse 18 and Ephesians 1 verses 22 and 23, The fact that there is only one body means there is only one church. Now, maybe you recognize the need to be part of the universal church that belongs to Jesus Christ, but perhaps you question the need to be part of a local church and attend the assemblies of a local church. So, let's consider some reasons the scriptures give indicating that you should be part of a local church. First, it is the approved example in the New Testament. Throughout the New Testament, beginning in the book of Acts, the constant example is Christians who join themselves to local churches. First, let me state something very plainly. You do not have to join a local church before you can enter a saved condition. God simply never demands it. As an example, consider the man in e- of Ethiopia in Acts chapter 8. Philip preached to this man while he was traveling in a chariot. Whenever he had been taught the gospel and was convinced of his need to be baptized, he expressed his desire to be baptized in verses 36 and 37. Verses 38 and 39 then say, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. Notice that this man went on his way rejoicing because he was saved, even though he had not yet joined himself to a local church. So the question then becomes, does God expect those who become Christians to join local churches after they are saved? The scriptures appear to answer that question as yes. Certainly it is what he desires, though it may not always be possible. Again, the consistent example God shows us in the New Testament is for individuals who become Christians to join themselves to local churches. I do not know of a single example in the scriptures that show a person becoming a Christian 
choosing not to join a local church and being acceptable to God. But I know of many approved examples showing Christians joining themselves to local churches. The most notable example is Saul, later known as Paul. Acts chapter 9 and verses 26 through 28 shows Saul joining himself to the local church in Jerusalem. It says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him and did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles, and he declared to them how he had seen the Lord on the road, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So he was with them at Jerusalem, coming in and going out. In addition to this, you should recognize that every time you read about a local church in the New Testament, the inference is that Christians join themselves together in this way. So, whenever you read about the church in Jerusalem, you must conclude that people did the same thing as Saul and expressed their desire to join the church. So it is with the churches in Corinth, Galatia, Thessalonica, Colossae, Antioch, etc., etc., etc. And therefore, you can be certain that you are doing right whenever you join yourself to a local church that believes, teaches, and practices what the Bible teaches. Another reason to be part of a local church is to worship with other Christians. One of the things that local churches are taught by God to do is to assemble as a church for worship. The universal church has no collective earthly assemblies, but the local church does. For instance, 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 23 speaks of when the whole church comes together in one place. Yet, if God did not want people to join local churches, this could never happen. When the local church assembles, God has specified the following five things as activities of worship it is authorized to engage in. Singing, Colossians 3 verse 16, praying, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 15, Bible teaching, Acts 20 and verse 7, taking up the collection, 1 Corinthians 16 verses 1 and 2, and partaking of the Lord's Supper, Acts 20 and verse 7. Yet, if God did not want people to join local churches, how would people worship in the collective way these passages indicate? You see, while Christians can and should worship God individually, as we saw in John 4 verses 21 to 24, God still wants Christians to worship him together within the assemblies of local churches whenever they're able to do so. In fact, God knows that these collective worship assemblies will also serve as an encouragement to those who are worshiping, and they will realize that they're not alone in serving and worshiping God. And then, you should also consider that the only time God has authorized the collection, 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 and 2, and the Lord's Supper, Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 11, verses 17 to 34, relates to the assemblies of local churches. So, how can you fulfill these responsibilities whenever you're not part of a local church? Furthermore, listen to Hebrews 10, verses 24 and 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Now, ask yourself, how can I keep this commandment not to forsake or neglect assembling with my brothers and sisters in Christ if I habitually stay away from all organized religion. The fact is that you cannot. Another reason to be part of a local church is to work with other Christians. Although God has given every Christian personal responsibilities in serving and accomplishing his work, he has also given some specific work to the local church. The first of the threefold work God has given local churches is the work of evangelism, or teaching the lost. For instance, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 8 says, 
For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. While Christians must work to preach the gospel individually, this was being written to the church of the Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 1. Local churches can accomplish much more in teaching the gospel of Christ together than an individual may be able to accomplish separately. But if God did not want Christians to be part of local churches, how could this work be done by local churches? The second work God has given to local churches is the work of edification, or building up the saved. God's design of the local church is for the edifying of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, verse 12. So, local churches must be focused on helping those who are Christians become stronger in the faith. This is accomplished whenever local churches teach the Word of God and worship God together. For instance, Paul told the local church at Corinth regarding their assemblies that all things were to be done for edification, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. But if God did not want Christians to be part of local churches, how could this work be done by local churches? The third work God has given local churches to do is to show benevolent help toward needy Christians. For instance, Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 1 through 3. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. And when I come, whomever you approve by your letters, I will send to bear your gift to Jerusalem. But if God did not want Christians to be part of local churches, how could this work be done by local churches? As a final point of consideration, you should recognize that God wants you to be part of a local church in order to share in accountability with other Christians. God knows that it is difficult for anyone to live for him in the midst of a sin-filled world, as you can see in Matthew 7, verses 13 and 14. So, he has given Christians a base of fellowship and strength that is greater than the individual. This is the local church. Consider, for instance, in Hebrews 3, verses 12 and 13, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So, God does not want Christians living isolated lives from other Christians. Instead, his plan, as we've seen, is for Christians to join themselves to other Christians in their areas. These individuals will have the opportunity to help and encourage one another to serve the Lord faithfully. In fact, there are many one another responsibilities God has given to Christians. And while they're not limited to brothers and sisters in Christ in the local church, the local church is one of the best places for these responsibilities to be fulfilled. For instance, in addition to exhorting one another every day, Christians are told to greet one another with a holy kiss, Romans 16, verse 16. Bear one another's burdens, Galatians 6, verse 2. Comfort each other and edify one another, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 11. Consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, Hebrews 10, verse 24. Have fervent love for one another, 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, 1 Peter 4, verse 9, and several others. But, how will you fulfill these responsibilities effectively if you're not part of a local church? And then, you should also consider that the local church is intended to provide accountability for Christians. If you're not part of a local church, there may not be anyone around you who will help you Return to the Lord if you sin against him. But members of a local church are expected to fulfill that work and will be in a position to fulfill that work. For instance, Galatians 6 and verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, 
You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And James chapter 5, verses 19 and 20 says, Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. In addition, God desires for there to be elders or overseers who will shepherd, will help shepherd you so that you will serve God faithfully. As we close this study, let's just recognize we need organized religion. Organized religion is not an invention of man, although man has often perverted it. Instead, God has built his one universal church that you must be part of and desires for you to be part of a local church that follows his perfect pattern.